Welcome back, Zero K fans, to. Oops. Welcome back, Zero K fans, to Nanalia the Don. I remain your host, Chad Fury Three Three. And this next match is a live match between Dimefriend and Lamadeus. Dimefriend going for the Hovercraft Factory, and Lamadeus, unlike the last two matches we watched of them, going for the Light Vehicle Factory. We're on Titan Duel, which is definitely a map I would go Light Vehicle Factory on, because this map. I mean, it's a vehicle map in general. Hovercraft's also good. I just personally like light vehicles. But Dimefriend going for the light, going for the hovercraft. They want to do the thing. I'm sure they'll be a bit surprised that Lamadeus is not going for hovercraft and not going for the hovercraft mirror. But that's how it's going right now. So Dimefriend, I expect to see something in chat because, well, I don't know, maybe. <laughs> oh, fail thus. I don't know how brave light vehicles is. I mean, it's a pretty standard choice, but yeah, it's a bit tricky. The light vehicle hovercraft matchup, it's a question of how you set up for the mid game. Because once scalpels get out, light vehicles has ravagers. They don't really have anything else. Mind you, a lot of people would argue that ravagers are all light vehicle factory ever needs, but it's still a bit annoying. At any rate, Dimefreund right now, with the economic advantage metal-wise, and that's fine as long as they get their energy up in time, and it looks like they are definitely doing so, then Dimefreund will be in a great spot as long as they can keep themselves from getting harassed too hard. At this point, Lamadeus is doing a bit of a soft contain, but not really much harassment, and actually, never mind, even that much is not happening as Dimefreund is able to get these daggers to do all the work. That is exactly... Wait. Oh, yeah, in, in his heat... <laughs> Lamadeus has already won in that small part of the race. Although I feel like that's one of those things that's like... That's not a really common English word, is it? Heat. For, like, in your heat. It's it's specific to certain races and relays and such, and more than anything. I digress. Diamond Friend, going for the counter-harassment, this is where it's going to be a lot stronger. Oh, okay, Anarchid pointing out that Lamadeus is not used to using light vehicles, and maybe, I don't know, I mean, they're a long-time TA player, and light vehicles carry a lot from the basic Total Annihilation Tier 1 vehicle factory. So, if you're used to that, well then, you're kind of used to light vehicles. As it is, both players are relatively even. I think Dimefriend is going to be setting up a stronger economic setup at first, Lamadeus is not expanding as quickly. They only have their commander expanding with the mason in the back a little bit. Dimefriend, on the other hand, has this forward quill, has their commander as well, and is generally making sure that Lamadeus isn't putting a stop to this. That being said, Lamadeus does have their levelers out, so the daggers can only go so far. The daggers have to be careful where they position themselves, otherwise, of course, they will die. A horrible, explosive death. Now, I'm not sure how much Lamadeus is going to actually manage to take advantage of that. Diamond may still not care. I mean, they know where the levelers are. They know that they are. And they're just going to go for scalpels. The daggers can still go around where the levelers aren't. There's still, like, nine of them, so they can easily get through any Lotus. Like, a couple of them take some damage. The remaining eight one-shot the Lotus. And then the Lotus is gone. And the rest of that area is completely open. And they just repeat that. I mean, the thing, thing is, is that daggers don't actually have any way of healing. That's the one problem. They have to be careful with the micro in that case. Make sure that no one dagger is taking too much damage. But as it stands, the daggers just don't have to worry about the levelers. Dimefrain, do you have radar here? Oh, wait. One sec. Wrong player. Yes. Look, Dimefrain does have some radar. They have awareness of where the levelers are enough to know that the levelers are not where they need to be. And there's a dead lotus. Right away. Oh, what? Oh, Oh, that Lotus got lucky. I thought these dealt like 110 damage each. Yeah, they do. It's weird that it didn't quite deal enough to kill. Still, that is fine. Dimefriend's commander also going down, though. So Dimefriend out of their economy, and their economy is pretty heavily weakened as a result, but Lamadeus lost most of their metal extractors in the process. So, a lost commander, bad, but a lost metal extractor set and possibly factory. And why is this not going? So, I mean, as it is, Lamadeus is still not really doing that well. Dimefriend has managed to get the storage up, so they're back in business as far as keeping their metal going. They did lose some metal, but not all that much, all things considered. 
especially given that Lamadea has lost most of the middle extractors. So Dying Friend still with an economic advantage, even losing the plus four from their commander. Even with that, and Lamadea is cheekily trying to get the reclaim. Wow. That's a thing you do. I mean, of course you do. That's a lot. That's about a thousand metal. I'm oh, sorry, 500 metal. Still, that's overall like 600 metal. That's something that Lamadeus could use. Dying Friend not letting them get that. Getting rid of the Mason. Great move there. And at this point, Dying Friend should be able to secure the Southwest. Should be able to secure their commander. They just need to get a quill over there or two. Get that reclaim going. And Dying Friend will be in a great spot. Wisely, though, they are setting up their energy first. So they aren't getting themselves into an excess position. But they might want to actually still get a quill over here pretty quick. I mean, the thing is, is Lamadeus does want to take that if they can. It looks like they don't care as much, though. It looks like they might actually end up being a distraction, as the northeast appears to be the more threatened spot. Lamadeus is sending over pretty much everything they have over to the northeast. Which, granted, isn't that much, but, you know, a couple levelers and a ravager. Still a threat. Something the Scalpels can deal with. It's not an insurmountable threat. But it is still a threat, it does still require a response, and that response seems to be moderately effective, but the quill is it's forced to retreat. There's no other way about it. Lamadeus is getting some revenge here. Suicidal revenge, mind you, and the quill being here means that they're going to be able to get this 400 or so metal reclaim on top of rebuilding the metal extractors once it's done. So Lamadeus not quite able to set anything up here effectively. And there's the quill. That's what they need. There's the reclaim going to be coming in. Dying Friend has the energy to deal with the reclaim. So this is going to be no problem whatsoever. Lamadeus right now switching over to just pure Ravager pretty much. Well, Ravager, Ravager Scorcher with a few levelers. This is the composition I would go for. Although I almost feel like there should be some Wolverines coming in here. Like now that Lamadeus, or at least when Lamadeus had some breathing room, set some Wolverines here. Put up a bunch of mines so that Dying Friend has fewer places to go. And then work from there. Like, that's the thing you'd want to use. Possibly Impalers, though Impalers are expensive. Wolverines, at least, if they set up in advance, they work. And, okay, Floris, the 14th, wondering. Scalpel Rockets have been homing for a very long time. Like, I don't know when Scalpels didn't have homing rockets, actually. They, they got worse in a patch about a year ago, so that units could actually dodge them from time to time. But, yeah, they've been homing forever. And, I mean, pointing out, people in the chat going on about Wolverines, I mean, it's an option. Like I said, Impaler would probably be a better option to deal with that. But hey, it's a thing that can kind of work. I just don't see Scorchers working very well. Same problem as daggers, you just get the scalpels AoEing them to death. What is Lamadeus doing, I wonder, at this point? Like, their plan does seem to be break the contain, get Dying Friend out of their face. But Dying Friend, at this point, they're just reclaiming. They're just getting their economy going quite strongly. Very strongly, in fact. It's a little surprising they don't have a second factory built up yet. But that's fine. I mean, they still have loads of money. They're still doing great here. And I don't see any easy way out of this. Lamadeus doesn't have the units to deal with this on hand. The Ravagers are trying, but it's just not enough. They certainly aren't being aggressive enough to make it work. Like, that's the main problem. If there were enough Ravagers and they were being aggressive to get rid of the Scalpels, that could work. And we do have a Scorch coming in, actually trying to disprove what I said earlier. Getting close enough that the homing isn't working, at least in a couple of cases, but there is the homing that works. That's what they need. There's almost a dead quill as a result of all that. But yeah, that's the thing. The, the Scorchers, if they get close enough, it works, but they have to actually get that close. And Scorcher Ravager could work beautifully if they're coordinating, but it doesn't appear that they are. And that's the thing that's going to kill Lamadeus here, along with losing their commander, just like that. Penetrator coming in here, wiping out Lama's commander, wipe, which reduces their economy enough that they just figured there's no point left. This game is over. And that is it. They throw in the towel. Still pretty impressively close. And near the end, it started to get lopsided, but opening it a bit there, yeah, I like that. That worked out nicely. 
Kind of sucks that Lamadeus didn't have quite the options available, or at least didn't use the options they had to deal with the hovers. Hover, like I said, Light Vehicle versus Hover is a weird matchup that you don't see a whole lot. So I'm not surprised Lamadeus didn't quite know how to deal with that. I mean, it's not an easy matchup. Scalpels really make things tricky. So it turns out we are continuing along with this. Lamadeus and Dynefrune will continue playing, so we're going to have probably a best of three effectively coming up shortly. I mean, after a small break, we will have that back on whatever map presumably Lamadeus chooses. So that'll be up in a couple minutes. Stay tuned for that. Welcome back, Zero K fans. Natalie is the Dawn, and we have more exhibition matches. I remain your host, Chad Fury Three Three Three, and this is still live between Dimefriend and Lamadeus. Dimefriend winning the first match. It looks like this might end up being a best of three, with this being on Trojan Hills. Dimefriend going for Shieldbot Factory. Lamadeus going for Cloaky Bot Factory. Hey, we've seen more Cloaky with the Glaive Buff. Actually, this is a matchup I really want to see. Cloaky versus Shield is easily the matchup that motivated that Glaive Buff. I mean, there might be others as well, but. Glaive versus Bandit is always just this weird setup. It's The thing is with that matchup, and Glaive versus Bandit in general, is that it's so close how this is going to go. Because with the Bandits, I mean, that's what Shield has at the start. And Glaives used to be a bit weaker. I mean, they still kind of are. It's sort of the thing where you kind of need like five Glaives or four Bandits. But at this point, I think the costs might actually be a little bit in the Glaive advantage. It's such a tight thing. It's so difficult to know which way the matchup is going to go or which way that, that small aspect of the Shield and Cloaky matchup is going to go that I'm curious to see how this is going to pan out. And starting out, we stop. Time friend, what's going on? Oh. Oh. Uh, I don't see any lag here. Why is this not showing lag? That's weird. Time friend apparently has no lag. Okay. Well, that kind of sucks, but yeah, I as I was saying, bandits are just a little bit healthier. They have a bit more health than glaives. They're a bit tougher than glaives. They have a bit of a higher attack power than glaives. But actually, no, a bit lower attack power than glaives. That's the thing. Glaives are slightly stronger. Bandits are slightly tougher. And Glaives are way faster now. I mean, they, their speed got increased recently, but even before then, they were still faster. And Glaives are a bit cheaper, so it ends up working out that... Like I said, you need... You still need fewer Bandits than Glaives, but... It's tough to say exactly how many you need of either. And there's small little things to do with projectile accuracy, because Bandits are a little more accurate than Glaives. It's just so many little things and generally with raider micro there's just so many little things with how the matches with how that tiny little aspect of it goes that it's pretty easy for there to be so many different effects okay dime friends back we should be getting going pretty soon this will finally answer the question right off the bat at least how this is going to go Warzone active. and no it doesn't because lamadeus decides to turn around so much for that Actually decides to regroup more than anything. Looks like they're expecting Dimefriend had built up over to the Western Plateau, and no, no they didn't. Actually, Dimefriend hasn't gone there at all. In fact, going entirely to the south. And here's well, almost a moment of truth. Also, Bandit has longer range. That's another thing I forgot to point out. So yeah, one Glaive versus one Bandit, the Bandit wins. But four Glaives versus two or three Bandits, that's what I want to know. It should theoretically be close to even. Like I said, four to five matches with the cost. Four to three isn't quite the same. Like okay, five glaives to four bandits, that should be an even setup because of the costs available. Like the cost of the units, it does cost 20% more to build a bandit than a glaive. And at this point, the opening is fairly strong for Lamadeus, and the glaives able to get away, that's the biggest thing too. Glaives with their auto regen does give them a slight advantage in prolonged encounters. At this point, though, 
Lamadeus just retreating, trying to find a better position to work with. Actually, it looks like they're trying to set up a bit of a trap, almost. Like, the bandits come around, they don't manage to get to the glaives because of the hills, and then they just walk right into the glaives' range. But no, Lamadeus continuing to retreat from there. And at this point, Diamond with a slightly stronger economy, but that may not last as Lamadeus going around the south side just to try to make sure that there's no easy way Diamond Friend can build up. At the very least, make sure that southeast expansion can't be taken easily. But the south side is heavily defended. Diamond Friend's already on top of that. And also going for harassment of their own. But Lamadeus hasn't set up in the back side as much as Diamond Friend has. Lamadeus has been much more forward going for the eastern plateau. Not so much for the northern areas, which now they're building towards, but that's not their main expansion they're setting up. Dying Throne, however, did primarily set up in the south. Which is interesting when you look at the way the players have set up and whether they're, they're attacking. Both players are attacking in the places that they are intending to set up. Lamadea started out raiding over to the western plateau, while Dying Throne immediately goes to the north. And considering the way that they're expanding with Diamond Lamedes in the eastern platform and Diamond Friend to the south, which granted is more typical. Like, with the way Diamond Friend is going, that is the typical approach, is to go to the northern back area. That's not surprising. What is kind of surprising is just how much Lamadeus was going for this western plateau without considering... The, I mean, they considered the backside a bit, but it's just kind of funny. There's some hints you could have got that could have been taken from that about where they'd expand. Especially given that Lamadeus just did not expand here and, in fact, does have these bandits pinned. That's three bandits, that's just, they're dead. They're dead, their metal's gonna become reclaim fodder. They managed to kill a couple glaives in the process, but that's all food for Lamadeus. 153 metal worth of food for Lamadeus. At the same time, though, this bandit assault here over to the eastern side of the map, a couple extra bandit kills than there should have been thanks to the positioning. They were in a line, didn't manage to get the Lotus to distract themselves, or didn't manage to get close enough to the Lotus to kill it in time, but still managing to break the eastern side a little bit. That being said, Lamadeus with just a slightly stronger Glaive setup. They have Glaives everywhere around the map. It's a little bit trickier for the Glaives to be dealt with now. I mean, their higher speed does make it easier for them to position themselves as they'd like. But Dying Friend already switching over to Thug Law. They don't want to deal with the Raider game anymore. They want to switch over to the anti-Raider game and the Assault game more so. But it looks like even the Raider game is starting to go Dying Friend's way. I and mean, they're managing to establish a position, at least. Lamadeus has the center, but Dying Friend's already taken pretty much the entire edge. Like, the southern and western edge, that belongs to Dying Friend right now. And Dying Friend's economy is really showing it. I mean, these caretakers can't come soon enough. Actually, they're a little bit late, but they really can't come soon enough, that's for sure. Thankfully for them, the wind gens are also doing nicely. They just need a few more of those. I mean, that'll be built up in a sec, but... Yeah, the caretakers, that's the first priority. Get a bunch of those, get that metal used up, and then Dime Friend can reclaim as much as they'd like. Unfortunately, they are also losing the eastern side of the map. And while a lot of glaives died in the process, so did a convict, and that's the big story. Dime Friend losing the convict over to the southeast, and the glaives will get killed trying to get rid of the eastern expansion. One of them's going to die immediately to a defender. Another couple are going to die immediately to the lotus that they continue in, but they don't wisely. At the same time, though, there aren't any rogues to deal with these warriors easily. They can still be dealt with by the thugs, but there isn't the easy, safe way of dealing with them that you get from rogues. And with the amount of warriors that have been built so far, actually, warriors and Rocco's together, having been built from Lamadeus, this is a strong position that Dianferin does not have their unit composition to deal with right now. Dianferin can, though. Dimefront has the production capacity, they have the economy, they can work with this. Lamadeus, on the other hand, does not have the production to deal with the economy they have. So, that is a slight advantage. Unfortunately, yet again, or fortunately for Dimefront, fortunately for Lamadeus, another convict goes down thanks to Lamadeus' glaives, going around the map just wrecking up the place, making things difficult. And really, no radar? Oh yeah, that's a good point. What is Dimefront's radar situation? It exists. It's able to see some of the stuff going around the map, but it's not able to see all of Lamadeus' positioning. Which, I mean, you can't say that about Lamadeus, though. Lamadeus knows exactly what's going on. At least enough of the western side to know what they need to deal with. And of course, they can assume, I mean, it's shield bot factory, we're gonna get Thug Law. Thug Law Felon, there's the Felon, fairly early, actually. But I think that Dimeferen's just figuring, well, they kind of need to. That's what they need to do. They need to get in. They need to be able to have that firepower coming in there. They don't have a huge amount of shields to work with, but there are convicts. That is always a way of adding more shields into the ball. 
Thugs are going to be the the unit of choice, though. And actually, Dying Three not building a whole lot of convicts. Not even in their main queue. Entirely focused on Thug Law. Looks like Dying Frame wants to win this as quickly as possible. Just keep Lamedaeus from building up. And there's a Conjurer dead, so some revenge. Some small bit of justification for Dying Frame there, managing to get rid of Lamedaeus' additional expansion attempts with a convert convict of their own on their reclaim. Beautiful. That's what they need. And now the felon's in place. Problem, of course, being the rogues are sorry, the Rockos are in a great spot to deal with this because, I mean, Rockos can deal with shields no problem. Lamadeus' unit composition is exactly right. This is just perfect. Dynfrane does have the shields getting in here to help recharge all this stuff, help set this up again. But looks like the main option is actually going to be probably a Firewalker. Yeah, Firewalker indeed. It's going to be a Firewalker switch or a Firewalker assist. And that will be great. That'll get rid of the Rogues, sorry, the Rockos. Of course, they're going to have to worry afterwards about Banshees coming in there, which that'll be no problem. Get a few Vandals in there or get an Archangel in there. That's fine. Like, this isn't going to be hard for Undying Front to deal with right now. The problem, of course, is that the rest of this here is easy to deal with. And with the Felon down, the Banshees won't have much. The Felon's already gone down. Another Felon would help, but Thuglaw can't easily deal with Banshees. Outlaws, however, can, though. That's true, actually. Outlaws can deal with the Banshees beautifully. So if the Outlaws manage to get in and manage to get through the Banshees, if the Banshees get too close to that Outlaw Thuglaw ball, then those Banshees aren't going to do that much damage. However, this Northeastern ball, that is, or the Thug group here, that is going to be a problem. That's where things are going to fall apart here. And the Stardust as well, that's going to get rid of the Banshees, no problem. The Banshees got to avoid that. Like, this is the thing, the Banshees have to be very careful to avoid the Stardust, to avoid basically any riot forces, because they fly low enough to the ground that riot units will get rid of them, but that doesn't matter so much. There is still enough damage that can be dealt. Lamadeus can still break a lot of Dimefriend's energy economy in particular, because, man, these these wind generators are in the perfect spot. Like, they are constantly plus 2.3. They're also mostly dead, which, of course, provides its own complications. And at this point, though, these Banshees, they will be able to deal damage quickly enough that there's not a whole lot of concern. There isn't much in here. The van there are Vandals being built up to help deal with the Banshees. They should be enough to break the Banshees in time. One of the caretakers is going to go down. The second caretaker should live. And yes, it does. Slightly unfortunate, but there are enough caretakers here for Dying Friend to be able to continue to build up without accessing metal. They just need a bit more energy, but that should be able to be built up quickly enough. I mean, look here, Dying Friend's already got Wind Generator set up. Dying Friend's on top of this. They're not going down quickly, and they already have the Fireworkers as well, so the Firewalker Assist is doing its job, breaking over the center lines. And at the same time, more Banshees coming in over to the eastern side, which does hit that Thug group I was talking about before, the one without any Outlaw support. Which, if it had Outlaw support, this would not happen. And over to the southeast, there isn't much defense here, so the Banshees from Lamadeus are going to be able to wreck the southeast without much in the way. Like, there's no opposition here. A few Banshees might die, but this is all dead. This area's dead. This area to the south is dead. There's a few Vandals to try to defend, but that's not going to be enough. Over to the center, though, that can pretty easily get in. I mean, the Firewalker, that can, that'll stop the, lo the well, everything. The Lotuses, the, Ro the Rockos, everything is all done. And there is the Spectre here to try to stop the Thuglaw Ball from doing too much damage, but it's not going to be the thing that'll work. And, of course, the Outlaws here getting rid of the Banshees making that life miserable. And why not have some rogues on top of that? So I think, I'd say Dying Friend's composition is a well-built composition. The only downside is that apparently the Firewalker is actually out of position right now. It's not helping out against the Rockos at all. And Lama Deus is still ahead economically. They are behind in territory, though. And it's just that they managed to break the Southeast hard. Still, Dying Friend with the Reclaim, they just need a bit more production. They should be fine once they have that. Get a bit more production, maybe get a bit more anti-air. And they got loads of Vandals, so that might be enough anyway. If they, those Vandals get in, get rid of this Brawler. And of course, the Firewalkers come in here, help get rid of the Rockers, as they are currently doing. This is still anyone's game. I mean, Lama is right now with the Brawlers to break open Dying Shield Ball. Dying Friend with the Firewalker to tear apart all these Rockers or soften them up so that everything else can come into the Bandits to help deal with them. 
mean, it's still a tricky fight, and I think a lot of it's going to come down to who gets the reclaim from this fight in the center. That's going to be a massive part of this game. And now the Vandals are in place, and the Firewalker's here to stop the Rockers from doing much. Ooh, this might actually be the thing that turns that around. That one Firewalker shot. Now that Dying Friend is able to dissuade these Brawlers from getting into the position they need to be in. That might actually do the trick. These Banshees are still complicating things, but overall, the Commander is in a relatively safe spot. They have the Razors up. They have the Stardust up as well. This area up top the plateau should still be in a good position, but Lamadeus's economy... Boy, is that ever strong. I mean, it's still way ahead of Dying Friends. That's a big thing. Dying Friend only has so much time. They've got to break what Lamadeus has as quickly as possible. The amount of reclaim here is quite impressive, and the static economy is still stronger for Lamadeus. Dying Friend is able to rebuild the southeast. That's giving them some room to breathe, but it's still problematic. It's still going to be an uphill struggle right now. Lamadeus just needs to hold on. They need to hold on, they need to be able to break this shield ball. If they can do that, I mean, if they got, like, an air factory and Thunderbirds, or they got shocking missiles, or they got ticks, just a couple, actually, no, ticks would be a bad idea. I mean, if they drop shift ticks in, that might work. Like, Valkyrie tick combo might do the trick. And they are going for the Zeus, which is the same general idea. Just use status damage to get rid of everything here. And the Banshee's coming into the ball. This is a mistake, and Lamadeus knows it. A little bit late, but they figured it out quickly enough that they're able to save most of the Banshees. However, the Brawlers are not a mistake. That is exactly what they need to do. And Lamadeus, with those Brawlers, will be able to stop the Shield Ball from doing much. The Shield Ball, however, it's the fact that it's spread out in a line like this might actually be beneficial. Because most of the Shields aren't taking damage from the Brawlers. It's only the ones at the front. The ones in the back are supporting the ones in the front, but the, they're not all taking damage together. However, at the same time, we are losing, or we're seeing quite a few Banshees go down as well. Sorry, Banshees, Brawlers go down as well. But that's fine. The Brawlers have done more than enough damage. They've pushed back Dimefreund, and Lamadeus can start to get in here and start to just break everything apart. The Banshees over to the southeast are making life miserable, although they, they themselves aren't actually managing to do a huge amount of damage. In fact, this is loads of metal donated to Dimefriend. This turned around quite a bit. Dimefriend could be able to get an economic advantage from this, or at least get back to parity. They do that. Then we could see the game turn around once again. And yet again, another shield ball comes in. No, no major Firewalker support, though. That's a problem that needs to be solved pretty quick. The lack of Firewalker support is still being an issue. The Banshees, so the Brawlers, are still making it difficult to push forward without losing the shields. And losing the shields means losing the felon damage capacity. Also, I kind of like Dime Friend's setup here. They actually are setting up the units, as far as I can tell, in a way that stops the Spectre from hitting the felons trivially. So at this point, looks like... Looks like there's not much that Dime Friend has that's actually quite the trump card here. And, oh, and this is opened up too. This felon is just about to die. There's the Spectre Shot's like six seconds away from going out there. But it is also in a bad spot. Oh, but the, the motivation to retreat is there. However, the felons are still alive. Both felons survived that. In fact, managing to dodge that one last shot there. So overall, the position is still fairly strong. Although this Lotus here isn't... No, oh, no, it's still managing to do the job. I mean, that's the thing, this southeast side, Lamadeus is trying to break it, but is throwing a lot of metal away to get rid of that, and throwing a lot of metal into Dimefriend's hands. So Dimefriend's now the one that needs to hold on. Though Lamadeus has managed to take this northwest. They have gotten a stronger static economy that aren't relying on Reclaim as much as before, so Reclaim is just bonus to them. Dimefriend needs Reclaim to stay basically competitive. And that's not a safe position to be in. And now with the Brawlers back, there isn't much more they can do. And it looks like Dime Friend going for the going for the standard setup, go for the Dante. I mean they have 30 plus metal. Get the Dante. Build that up. Use that to force the break. Just push things forward. And with the Firewalker in place, that does soften things up. That does make things a bit difficult. Oh, nice. And the bandits dodging most of the shots from the Spectres. If Lamadeus. Oh, they don't move them enough. And it looks like it's fine though, the warrior's stopping, but if they didn't move that enough, that would have been bandits coming in and unmasking all of them. 
Thankfully for Lamadeus, they are still able to keep their Spectres cloaked for the time being. At the same time, northeast side, the Stardust is not able to survive long enough. Dimeference Commander taking a last stand against these Zeus's. This is it. Dimeference Commander about to go down. No defenses are here to save them. This is Dimeference Commander's death. Or it would be if the Zeus's actually went for them. Yeah, Dimeference Commander, like two shots away from death. There it is. Dimeference loses their commander, loses their econ economic advantage. The northwest, or the center west side of the map, is basically broken. At this point, I almost expect Dime Friend to go for a counterattack, but no, instead they are... Actually, they might be going for a counterattack. They're at least trying to break the Lotus Wall here over to the western side, but no, they're going to try to get rid of the Zeus. Are they going to try to get rid of the Zeus? I kind of hope not. Because that's what Lamadeus wants. They want Dime Friend to get a little bit cautious here. A little overcautious, actually. Like, invest too many resources in this one bit of defense. And now the center's open. Lama Deus is going for it. I don't see any major resistance. The Dante won't be up quickly enough. It's only got, like, a minute. That's nowhere near enough time. Lama Deus is going to be able to get in, tear apart that Dante, and Dime Friend taking the long way around. Nothing stopping the Firewalkers are managing to deal some damage, managing to slow things down, soften things up. But Lama Deus has too much damage potential here. Thankfully for them, for Dime Friend, the Rogue is at least in place, but that's still not enough. Lamadeus' army here got like 6,000 metal army, whereas there's three rogues actually doing a pretty bang up job fighting that 6,000 metal army. I gotta say, the rogues are a good choice in this situation. But as it is, Lamadeus just has. They managed to break things open. They've managed to find the openings in Dynefern's defenses and. Dimefriend throws in the towel. I really thought Dimefriend had that game. Like, I felt like Dimefriend had it. All they needed to do early on, I think the main thing I would have liked to see is to just go for it. Like, when they really had the opening and they had that first felon, they just, I think if they had gone for it or gone around, like, not necessarily gone frontal assault, but gone around the back here, especially after the Zeus, gone around the back and pushed Lamadeus to think, oh, wait, maybe I should be retreating. Maybe I should be the one going back and defending my base. That might have done the trick. Because, yeah, the Zeus was doing some damage, but, you know, a few felons would have been able to take that. Sorry, a few rogues would have taken that out, no problem. Going over here, though, forcing Lamadeus on the back foot, that would have been dangerous. That, or... Taking their big force and going along the eastern side and breaking Lamadeus' economy over here. I think the biggest problem, though, is the Banshees did soften things up for Dynefriend. Like, they had to deal with that, they had to set up defenses, they had to lose their economy throughout, and Lamadeus got the economic advantage as a result. We see, like, metal income was actually in Dynefriend's favor for a while, and then the Banshees came in and just wrecked everything. It made it far harder to maintain a metal advantage. It actually doesn't help that Dynefriend accessed a bunch of metal at the point they lost their commander, too. Or just losing their commander in general, that was also extremely painful. Still strong showing from both players. So I'm imagining we're probably going to see a tiebreaker at this point because we have just seen, well, it's one and one. So I don't know if we're going to have a tiebreaker or not. I see that. Looks like, yes, and we are going to have a tiebreaker as Lionel Deus and Dying Frame both are back in this. They still want to keep playing. So that will be whenever they pick a map. I'm guessing it's Dying Frame's choice given the circumstances. So stay tuned for that. It'll be up in just a couple minutes. Welcome back, Zerke fans, to Natalie the Dawn. I remain your host, Shadow Fury 33 and this last match between Dime Friend and Lamadeus Tiebreaker on Comet Catcher will be starting very shortly. I mean, it's kind of the tournament we didn't have this morning, in a way, although admittedly there weren't very many signups there, unfortunately. But yeah, we are starting on CCR Hovercraft for Lamadeus, Hovercraft for Dime Friend, Hovercraft Matchup Mirror. Those words came out in the wrong order, but it is the Hovercraft Mirror Matchup that we've all been waiting for, with Lama Deus actually playing Hover again. Unlike the Titan Duel game, the first game in this little mini-series that we saw Hovercraft versus Light Vehicles with Lama Deus 
behind the car wheel. Dimefriend and Lemadeus both now going for the hovercraft, and this... Once again, we see Dimefriend going for the early economic start, Lemadeus going for the early aggressive start with the early three daggers, actually four daggers, before building up any other economy. I'm sorry, five daggers! Already one in Dimefriend's face. Not really managing to do a huge amount, though. I and mean, causing some small problems, but really just distracting Dimefriend. Oh, never mind, Retreat Micro does work for daggers! My mistake earlier! Retreat Micro is totally useful, it just increases the range that little bit. So yeah, I was talking about this earlier, so the way that... For those of you not familiar with this at all, the way that Total Annihilation and its spiritual successor games, including Zero K, work, is that every single projectile is physically simulated. It's a big part of the game. And it's a really big part of Zero K in particular. So... One thing, though, is that... For whatever reason, either for simulation cost reasons, or just because it wasn't thought of, Projectiles don't actually inherit momentum. So normally, say if you're moving at a certain speed and you throw a projectile or you shoot a gun or whatever, the bullet speed is affected by your speed. So if you're moving forward at like 100 kilometers an hour and you shoot a gun, well, that gun's gonna, that bullet's gonna shoot out 100 kilometers an hour faster in that direction. Or if you're moving away from the way you're shooting it, it's gonna move 100 kilometers an hour slower in that direction. Zero K doesn't actually use that. So if units are moving away and they shoot, their bullets are going to go to the edge of the range at the point they shot, not the edge of the range at the point that the bullet impacts, which is where it would end up if it was actually inheriting velocity. The effect of this is that if you're retreating away from enemies and firing at them, your ra the range of that unit is effectively increased by their speed, rather than decrease, rather than like kind of stayed the same or decreased effectively by their speed. I personally kind of like this. It means that there's like, there's some reason to kind of this give and take on unit micro. You can't just go forward and juke around. You have to think about, well, maybe if I run away, it works a bit better. But it isn't entirely physically accurate. It is one of those minor little bits of unintuitive physics simulation that this game does that you kind of need to keep in mind when you're playing it. Anyway, with that said, and with the clear clarity that daggers actually do benefit from said micro, we are seeing Lamadeus coming in very strong with seven daggers coming, or six daggers ultimately, coming in here with no real opposition. The defender is not going to be able to do much, gets rid of one, but all of these metal extractors are done at the same time. Lamadeus with another three daggers over to the western side of Diamond base. Lamadeus just wanted to finish this quick, and they did indeed. Three minutes into the game, and already it's done. Lamadeus wins two to one in this little series that's going on here. I love this little scoreboard. <laughs> I'm glad I made that. Yeah, it's like this thing is the thing that's actually in everything. If you open to the player list, the player list has it too. So yeah, there, two to one. Lamadeus takes it right away with that opening aggression. This is not something you see on CCR a lot. Opening aggression like that is rare on CCR. It's practically a map that you play because you don't want opening aggression. You want to have a 20 minute game where you're building up plus 50, plus 60, plus 70 metal per second, and then building up striders and two or three factories and just going ham with this giant army or something like 50, 60 unit armies that you'd have, that you'd only have in a map with so many resources as this one, with as many metal extractors as Comic Catcher. But nope, Lamadeus just wanted to win real quick and did. So that was that. I hope you enjoyed that. I hope you enjoyed this little live series, which I certainly did. I like having this stuff live. It's, it's something I mentioned last, no, two weeks ago that I wanted to see if people wanted to do, and we have it, and it's been done. I am very happy about that. So I hope you enjoyed that as much as I did. Thank you all for watching, everyone, and have a good night.